Hello everyone and welcome to the Integrative Pharmacology introductory webinar on natural products. I'm Dr. Kelly Heim and today's presentation will focus on basic principles of pharmacodynamics. And then in part two, I'll present the basic principles of pharmacokinetics as they pertain to natural products. And I'm sure many of you have different medical backgrounds and different areas of professional focus. But regardless of these differences, I think we can all agree on one thing, and that's the goal of preventing or treating disease. And the strategy of medicine is really the bigger conversation that I wanted to start with. And I'll summarize it in four steps. The first thing you want to do is identify what's going on, and that's the realm of diagnostic medicine, so diagnostic tools. But what I'm going to focus on today is understanding the underlying biology and then matching that to administer a precise therapy. These two steps are collectively the domain of pharmacology. And finally, monitoring progress, that's something that you have in your clinical uh, toolbox, but it's not really pharmacology. So I wanted to define the field first as it fits into the bigger strategy. You may have taken pharmacology in medical school, and unfortunately, many medical students get through that class by mostly by rote memorization because it can be a very overwhelming subject the way it's currently taught uh, but hopefully i will distill it down and make it more fun for you to learn with a focus on natural products make it useful to you as you navigate the field of integrative therapies what i love about this field is that it's all about strategy and precision so what i mean by that is first we have to understand a biological target get to the root of what's going on in a patient. And then next, we have to get to that target. We have to give a therapy that's going to get there and do something that's going to hit that target. It's not going to really hit anything else. It's not going to do any harm. This is the whole strategy of medicinal agents. And collectively, it can be described as pharmacodynamics. And that's one of the branches of pharmacology. And that's going to be the focus of today. The more you understand why and how medicines work, the more precise the more effective you're going to be as a clinician and the more satisfied you're going to be with the selections you make as far as medicines go, whether they're natural or pharmaceutical. And this is especially important in the age of precision medicine where it's really your responsibility to select the most precise tool to fit the needs of every individual who walks into your clinic. I like to mention this quote by E.M. Forrester, Choose a place where you won't do harm. Yes, choose a place where you won't do very much harm and stand in it for all you are worth facing the sunshine. Many of us can relate to this quote simply because we're passionate about what we do and at the end of the day, we want to help patients. But this is also resonant with the mechanics of pharmacology in that a good medicine should first do no harm, then it must stand up to this task of getting to a specific place a very specific location in the body and stand there long enough to face its mission and to achieve that mission, that healing or palliative action. In the proverbial clinical toolbox that you hear about in a metaphorical sense in many medical lectures, a working knowledge of pharmacology is analogous to a wrench. So think about a mechanic who has an adjustable wrench and that's it, versus a mechanic who has a very sophisticated and diverse repertoire of wrenches. Expanding your pharmacology knowledge is exactly this. You're, you're expanding your repertoire of a tool set to better fit every occasion. And make smart adjustments for whatever piece of work walks into your door. And I say this not only metaphorically, but in a literal sense, because medicinal agents are mechanical devices. They're molecules that are shaped in a certain way to precisely fit a receptor or other biological target, so to speak. And good medicines will literally tighten, loosen, or modify that physical structure of that nut or bolt in the body and change the function of those biological targets with, with strategy and precision. If you've ever opened a pharmacology textbook, you'll notice that there are two branches. And unfortunately, they're often two, two different uh, parts of the book, but please realize that these are integrated. Pharmacodynamics describes what the drug does to the body, that's its mechanism of action, its clinical effects. Pharmacokinetics is all about what the body does to the drug, distribution, metabolism, elimination, and so forth. In this lecture, for simplicity, we'll focus on pharmacodynamics, and in part two, we'll focus on pharmacokinetics.
So there are four parameters that collectively define pharmacodynamics. And keep in mind, this is all about developing an effective drug or selecting an effective tool in your toolbox. These are principles that determine how the medicinal agent will affect the body. First, finding the target. How does the, the compound get to the target? That's more about pharmacokinetics, but we're going to talk about what these targets are. Secondly, you have to interact with that target. You have to inhibit it. You have to activate it. What are you going to do to it and how? Thirdly, you have to do so with strength. If you're too weak, you're not really going to be effective. If you're too strong, you might be toxic. And then the fourth parameter is precision. So you have to really just hit that target and try not to hit anything else. Most therapeutic agents work by binding to proteins that regulate a specific biological process. And in pharmacology, we call them targets. And there are four main types of targets. We have receptors, we have enzymes, transporters and channels, and transcription factors. So these are all proteins. They're all encoded by genes. Uh, yet another reason to learn pharmacology is to be able to translate genetics in clinical practice. You have to know what, what these targets are and uh, what, it, what genes affect them in order to understand all of that. So these are the four major types of biological targets that medicines modulate. Let's talk about receptors first. Many compounds interact with receptors to exert their therapeutic action. A receptor recognizes and binds that compound, also called a ligand. Most receptors are located on the surface of cells, and by sitting there, they're poised to detect signals from the environment and warn the cell to prepare a rapid response. So being chased by a bear, for example, triggers the release of epinephrine, which is the ligand, and that binds to adrenergic receptors on the surface of muscle fibers, and that increases their strength and stamina so you can better escape from that bear. So that's a primitive example of a receptor ligand interaction. Other examples of ligands are hormones like insulin and estrogen, neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine, as well as inflammatory mediators like cytokines. So they bind to that receptor and they cause the cell to respond and do something. So effective medicines often mimic or compete with or block the actions of these ligands at their receptor sites. One of the most famous examples of a ligand receptor interaction is insulin binding to the insulin receptor, which is located on the surface of cells. And here we have insulin binding to the receptor and that causes a signaling cascade that triggers the exocytosis of vesicles that contain GLUT4 transporters. These are the glucose transporters that, that then allow glucose to be absorbed into the cell. So this could be a muscle cell, it could be a fat cell. It basically involves a signal cascade, which we'll define in the next slide, that causes this biological response. Once bound by a ligand or a pharmacological agonist that mimics that ligand, the receptors transmit a signal into the cell by activating or modulating proteins downstream of it. So this is essentially a chain reaction, if you will, or a signal transduction pathway, also called a signaling cascade. These pathways connect the cell's environment with its innermost workings, and it allows it to respond rapidly and in a coordinated way. Signaling pathways are fundamental to understanding health and homeostasis because they allow communication with the outside world. The proteins that are involved here almost always include enzymes, and ultimately the signal can reach the nucleus to alter gene expression through transcription factors that get activated to elicit a therapeutic response. In pharmacology, you'll often see what we call pathways, and they involve multiple biological targets that participate in a coordinated biological action. So it's never just something binding to a receptor, something happens after that. Two things to remember about signal transduction pathways. First, they connect the environment with the genome. And secondly, they involve multiple types of proteins and thereby offer diverse opportunities for therapeutic interventions. You might not just wanna hit the receptor, you might wanna hit some of these downstream proteins as well, because you might get a more stable response. You might get a safer and more effective therapy if you target more than one step. Many pharmaceuticals act just by binding a receptor or just by binding an enzyme or just a transcription factor, whereas many natural products tend to hit more than one at a time. That's one of the biggest distinctions between the pharmacology of pharmaceuticals and natural products. 
To take a closer look at what a membrane receptor looks like, many of them have multiple transmembrane domains, as shown here. A ligand will bind to the extracellular part of that structure and cause a conformational change, and that sets off that signal transduction cascade. Membrane receptors, again, are there to respond to the environment. Neurotransmitters, insulin, many drugs bind to these types of receptors. Another important type of receptor is the nuclear receptor, which recognizes hormones, uh, fat-soluble vitamins like A and D, certain fatty acids, including the fatty acids we obtain in the diet, and xenobiotics that, that include environmental toxins. They bind to these nuclear receptors, which change gene expression for better or for worse, changing the expression of dozens, if not hundreds, of different genes, collectively enlisting a signature of gene expression that changes the overall function of the cell. So we've gone through the different biological targets. Let's talk about the interactions with those targets. And there are two main types of interactions. If you want to activate the receptor, you want to give an agonist. If you want to block the receptor, you want to give an antagonist. You can have a direct agonist that mimics the endogenous ligand. An example would be dexamethasone, which mimics cortisol. It occupies that same site in the glucocorticoid receptor. So that receptor thinks that cortisol is binding and it does all the same things that cortisol would. An indirect agonist will bind a different site on the receptor, not competing with the ligand, but at the same time activating it. An example of an indirect agonist would be cannabidiol, which activates serotonin 5-HT1A receptors uh, in an indirect way. Antagonists will block the receptor. Competitive antagonists will bind the site that's normally occupied by the endogenous ligand, preventing that ligand from gaining access to that site. An example would be caffeine competing with adenosine, which is a powerful endogenous sedative for the adenosine receptor. So adenosine is what our bodies make when uh, we're exerting ourselves, and it's one of the reasons why we start to feel fatigued after being physically active. Blocking adenosine is a great way to keep yourself alert and awake, and that's exactly how caffeine works. If you want to learn about how caffeine works, a great example of uh, competitive activity at the receptor level, there's a flashcard available at integrativepharmacology.com. If you want to learn about agonists, uh, read the GABA agonists from one of the world's oldest plants article on integrative pharmacology to learn about substances found in magnolia that are agonists of the GABA receptor. And GABA receptors are very sedating uh, chloride channels. Enzymes are perhaps the most important biological target to familiarize yourself with if you want to better understand medicine, because so many medicines interact with enzymes. Enzymes sustain life by converting one molecule to another, A to B. So this is what an enzyme really looks like. It's a protein, and this is a protein called 5-alpha reductase. So it's an enzyme that converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which causes male pattern baldness. It also causes benign prostate hyperplasia. Needless to say, it makes a lot of sense to develop compounds that block this enzyme. Um, so they're, therefore, these substances can be very useful for um, preventing or slowing male pattern baldness and also reducing the size of the prostate in uh, BPH. The interaction here is very strong. This inhibitor here, finasteride, fits very tightly. It fits very neatly. So good medicines should have appreciable affinity for their biological target, but not be so strong that they don't want to let go. We'll talk about that in a moment. But going back to the general topic of enzymes, it's a lot like a lock and key. When you're developing medicines, uh, you really want to focus on the shape and the size of the molecule that you're trying to get uh, to that enzyme and inhibit that enzyme or activate it. So it's all about the shape and the structure of the ligand or the substrate. Since all target proteins are encoded by genes, genetic differences can explain inter-individual variability in patient responses to all kinds of therapeutic agents. So understanding biological targets is very important in navigating pharmacogenomics and nutritional genomics. The third parameter in pharmacodynamics is strength or affinity. Affinity is the strength of the receptor ligand interaction. So binding to receptors occurs through chemical forces called bonds. And there are three types of bonds. The first is covalent bonding. This is the strongest and least common type of bonding in pharmacology. Very strong, usually irreversible bonds uh, that allow longer lasting effects because these uh, bonds just simply won't break on their own. You have, to, you have to destroy the whole receptor. You have to wait until the body recycles its own receptor and makes new ones. Um, so they tend to be longer lasting effects uh, because you're relying on the body to renew 
its own receptor uh, to get rid of that complex. The more common types of bonds are electrostatic bonds, which include hydrogen, ionic, and ion dipole bonds. Um, these are strong, they're also common. Um, hydrophobic bonds are, are weak, but they're also common. Uh, lipophilic drugs bind regions of receptors that are very rich in these hydrophobic amino acids. So anything that's a lipophilic drug or a natural product, for, for example, cannabinoids are lipophilic agents that bind to the region of the cannabinoid receptors that have these hydrophobic amino acids. What happens if you have a medicine that's not very strong, if the affinity is low? Does that mean it's completely worthless? Well, possibly yes. Uh, it could be completely worthless because you, you have to get a lot of the drug in there. Um, you have to make sure that the bioavailability is high. You have to get a high dose. Um, you just really have to saturate that site with a lot of whatever that molecule is. So some compounds are just very weak. Um, so in a test tube, they look great. Uh, they definitely hit their target. Um, not with great affinity, but they still work. You might see an in vitro study that showed that something activates a serotonin receptor, like a natural product from a plant activates a GABA receptor. Don't believe it until you look in vivo, uh, because those interactions are often very weak. And in clinical practice, you might need to get such a huge dose into the patient to recapitulate that interaction that it becomes not only impractical uh, from a, a compliance and cost standpoint, but could cause uh, a lot of other side effects that you wouldn't anticipate. So um, be wary of any evidence that's from an in vitro study that involves a natural product, simply because often the interactions are so weak that they're just not clinically relevant. And this is in part because of low affinity of natural products for receptors. So in summary, if it's got a weak affinity, you typically need more of it. If you want to learn more about drugs versus supplements with respect to affinity, I wrote a short article on integrativepharmacology.com that explains these affinity differences. So the final parameter in pharmacodynamics is precision or selectivity. Selectivity is really about what this medication is going to interact with. Is it just going to interact with one receptor? Is it going to interact with 12 receptors? Drugs typically interact with five, or seven, five to seven targets. They're initially designed to interact with just one in most cases. In retrospect, we have discovered that they bind to an average of five to seven. Food compounds, on the other hand, often bind to more than seven. Uh, many of them bind to more than 12. They're polypharmacological agents. They tickle some receptors and, and, and bind to others. They're a little bit more complex in that they have multiple targets. A metaphor that further describes the distinctions between drugs and natural products would be a table with four legs. And drugs, because of their higher selectivity, the fact that often they only have a couple of targets, they're a little bit more unbalanced uh, in some of their effects. And they might hit one uh, target a little too hard and destabilize the homeostasis of a biological system. Whereas natural products have lower selectivity, they tickle each leg with more equal force and are less likely to cause a destabilization. So um, in nature, you want balance, and that's, that's the way natural products tend to work um, in a more balanced way. Um, you're hitting more than one target with lower affinity as opposed to smashing one uh, with very high affinity. And you also have a lower selectivity, so you're hitting more than one target in a signaling cascade, for example, as opposed to hammering that one target, that one leg. So going back to the strategy of medicine to summarize, Identifying the problem is the realm of diagnosis, understanding the underlying biology, and matching it with a precise therapy is the realm of pharmacology. And there are two branches, pharmacodynamics, which we've summarized here in this first part, and pharmacokinetics, which we'll get to in part two. But pharmacology involves hitting a target, activating or blocking it with strength and with precision. I've gone through very basic principles today that will help you better understand medicines this concludes part one. I hope you'll stay tuned for part two, which will go into the pharmacokinetics of natural products. Don't forget to check out integrativepharmacology.com. There are three articles there that are directly relevant to some of the principles we've gone through today. And don't forget to check out the site, subscribe, and leave any feedback for me. Thank you.